How's everyone doing? In this section of the class, we're going to take a 30,000 foot overview of psychological processes involved in sport and physical activity. Psychology, as you can see from the title of Individuals in Sport, is concerned with individuals as the primary unit of analysis. In particular, psychology can be conceptualized as the scientific study of the human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior in a given context. Our context is sport, recreation, physical activity. Sports psychology can be defined as the study of the effects of psychological and emotional factors on sport and exercise performance. A clinical or counseling sports psychologist is someone that examines how athletes' life and their circumstances impact their livelihood or athletic performance while the educational sports psychologist is focused on training coaches, athletes, managers, and students in the current best practices of sports psychology. This latter one usually occurs in group situations as compared to the one-on-one -on -one clinical setting. A research sports psychologist is at the forefront of testing, developing, and researching best practices in maximizing human performance, such as visual imagery, and strategy, strategies that help manage pre-competitive anxiety using biofeedback, for example. Recently, though, the trend that I am lucky to be a part of is this developing area of sports counseling and how social workers are providing needed uh, expertise with regards to counseling services within athletic environments, such as within the intercollegiate athletic department. All of these individuals, regardless of the type of sports psychologist that they are, somehow, some way, are associated with that definition of studying the effects of psychological and emotional factors on sport and exercise performance. The beginning of sports psychology can be officially traced back to 1897 in Norman Triplett. Uh, Norman was at a racing cycling event, and he noticed that these cyclists performed better when racing against each other as compared to racing against the timed clock. This is rather new, and so what he did was he wrote a research report detailing these findings, and it was received quite well. While this seems sort of commonsensical now, at the time it was a revolutionary observation, and it was important enough to help separate sports uh, from other aspects of psychology. The momentum here in the United States continued with Coleman Griffiths in the 1920s. He established the first lab of sports psychology at the University of Illinois. This tradition is still alive and thriving with new services, ideas, and concepts being developed at this particular university and universities around the United States and the world. Some of these concepts, uh, whether you're talking about different forms of motivation, uh, again, visual imagery, different ways of dealing with stress before and after an event, these concepts help athletes, coaches, and other sport administrators that are looking to positively impact some modicum or of human performance within the athletic setting. And more recently, going back to the 1970s and the 1980s, there were two major developments in sports psychology. Firstly was the development of the interactionism paradigm. And this is a very, very important idea. And what it seemed to do was it helped to broaden the focus of sports psychology to include not just the athlete themselves, but also the athlete's interaction with the social environment around him. Again, this seems very commonsensical now, but at the time this is a departure from current strains of thinking and research. If you're playing in University of Michigan's Big House, for example, uh, this very, very large stadium routinely seats over 100,000 people every Saturday for a home University of Michigan football game. You can imagine, and it stands to reason, that that type of environment can have a huge positive or negative impact on how you manage your emotions and, as a result, your performance. The second major shift included the, the acceptance of what we call applied work in sports psychology. We are used to the phrase of applied learning in this program or at this university, but in the 1980s things were very different and they, and they tended to focus more on this idea of pure knowledge as compared to how pure knowledge can be used every single day, especially in athletic programs or sport organizations. As the discipline starts to evolve, 
Over the next 25 years or so, the field of sports psychology has grown and included an extension of this applied work. And this can be really be distilled into the area of organizational and individual development interventions. We've talked about these in previous lectures. But what these interventions really do is highlight the idea of how the work that was built in the 70s and the 80s came out of this notion of not just the interactionism paradigm, but really focusing on the day-to-day -day interactions within organizations or between coaches and athletes. Additionally, sports psychology is focused on the integration of surface level and deep level aspects of diversity. When you start thinking about diversity and recognizing how diversity is important to how we emote or how we perceive things in our day to day life, you can see how these ideas become so important. Surface level diversity characteristics include a recognition of attributes such as gender and race based experiences. Deep level characteristics include experiences such as those involving sexual orientation or socioeconomic status, um, cultural heritage, ethnicity, these types of things. Now that we know a little bit about the past of sports psychology, let's think about what we want to do moving forward. And what we really need is a beginning point. And when we're dealing with athletes or coaches or employees, a leader or a coach really needs a better understanding of the types of people they're going to be working alongside. Those people's personality is a great starting point. The more you know about the personality or the types of personalities of, your, of the people that are below you or that you're working with, the more you can tailor programs to suit your employees and your organization. Personality is all the consistent ways in which the behavior of one person differs from that of others, especially in social situations. And this is going to be very important when we start looking at how we have interactions with other people, not just within sport, but also in sport business organizations. In discussing or explaining the concept of personality, there are some historically important theories of personality in psychology. For our purposes, we're going to briefly discuss psychodynamics, social learning, and then humanistic theory. Sigmund Freud is often associated with psychodynamic theory or psychoanalysis. This theory is going to focus on the unconscious motivations of the individual, which are eventually going to influence action. The personality in this view is composed of the id, the ego, and the superego. The id is the impulsive and maybe even selfish nature of the person, while the ego represents sort of the expected or socially approved behaviors of society or culture. The superego is that thing that is stuck in between which attempts to balance this conflict. And what Freud and others subscribing to this view said is that how you balance that is how what aspects of your personality are going to be dominant and are going to come through in different social situations. Social thir learning theory is, is more of a paradigm, meaning it has quite a few different theories that are composed within it. Social le this, this, this paradigm focuses on what we see, how those behaviors influence us as individuals, and how we pass those behaviors on to other people. B.F. Skinner's behaviorism focuses on conditioning and how reinforcements influence the likelihood that a behavior is going to occur again. Albert Bandura's focus was more on role modeling this whole idea of imitation. We imitate the actions of people that are important to us or people that we see. And this is going to have a, a distinct impact on our cognitive development, our recognition, and the likelihood that we're going to reproduce that behavior that we see. A possible sport application of these two theories could include something like this. A professional athlete might struggle with having fame and millions of dollars given to them at age 19 or 20 years. And this might be associated with something like the, the NBA draft, when you have a, a large number of young men that become almost overnight millionaires. The athlete's behavior influences young people. This could be an example of role modeling. And can cause problems if the individual, the athlete, indulge in their impulsive urges too often in the, in the public view, resulting in a public backlash focused on the athlete's commitment to their sport. 
we know that a lot of the public is very jumps at the chance to make fun of athletes that have very public failures. And so the the onus, if you will, oftentimes is on the individual to manage these unconscious motives and these impulses. And if they do that, regardless of how they do that, young people are going to see what they do and be influenced. These two theories of personality can be applied to our world of sport. Humanistic theory is often associated with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which was popularized within sport by the legendary men's basketball coach John Wooden in the 1960s and 1970s. Essentially, humans progress up within the hierarchy of needs, which is graphically depicted on the right side of the screen there. Humans progressing upward need to have their basic physiological needs met first, which are going to include things such as food, water, and shelter. Next, humans need a sense of safety and security. And then they progress to the third stage of feeling a sense of love, community, or belonging to something larger than themselves. The fourth tier focuses on the individual's global self-esteem or their overall view of themselves. Finally, the top of the pyramid is what Maslow referred to as self-actualization. And this is simply the human need to give back to others. It's our need to grow or help grow other people. A possible sport application here is how sport fulfills the need of the collegiate student-athlete. A scholarship may provide food, shelter, safety, and a sense of belonging to a team, which are the first three basic levels according to Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. Providing, I don't know, something like a tutor or access to academic resources can positively impact a student-athlete's self-esteem. Self-actualization might be grown by a coach taking an interest in showing how student-athletes can give back to a community through volunteer work or using their sports high-profile nature in a community to raise money for a charitable organization. All these are based off of understanding that we as people have needs that must be met. Personalities differ, yeah, but research has shown that the relationship between a specific personality characteristics and different aspects of successful athletic performance is indeed a very strong correlation. For example, stable emotions and a strong mindset are often associated with the belief that an athlete can accomplish an important task, such as getting the winning hit in a softball game or making a penalty shot in soccer. And you can see this if we're talking about emotional stability here. It's going to be associated with this idea of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the belief that you can accomplish something that's important. Taking this personality performance linkage one step further, research has shown that as skill level increases, personality homogeneity on a team also increases. What does that mean? It means that athletes and coaches have very similar mindsets. So the higher and the more elite the level of sport becomes, the more people are the same the more that people think about the world the same way, and the more people on a particular team are going to emphasize those personality traits. As skill level decreases, personality heterogeneity increases. So this is just exactly the opposite. And sort of a, a landmark study in the, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, was done by Kroll, who just noticed that rookies have, on a, in a team setting, have very different characteristics. Veterans in the team setting have similar personality types. This lends credence to those two points that we just talked about above. It's worth noting that while studying aspects of a person's personality is, is a difficult scientific examination, it is important to understand the basic dimensions of a person's personality. And this is going to relate to maybe things such as leadership, coaching, or just being able to help motivate individuals. The four aspects of a personality, the broad aspects of a personality, include the unconscious motivations, measurable dimensions, the internal capacity for growth, and the influence from the outside world.
unconscious motivations, and this kind of comes out of the psychoanalysis tradition of the impulses. Measurable traits, this kind of comes from basic psychology, which says that how we view the world can be quantified. It can be measured. And as a result, we can correlate different dimensions of personalities together, such as being introverted or extroverted, things like that. The internal capacity for human growth relates back to that humanistic theory and maybe that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this whole idea of wanting to grow and be to constantly evolve and change as an individual. And finally, the influence from the exogenous environment is the outside world, and this might be something like the interactionism paradigm, or just realizing, and we'll talk more about this later in the course with social psychology, is that the outside world, the social environment, has a distinct influence on us as individuals. Affective states refers to an organism's reactions in regards to a stimulus or stimuli. And this is important because our interactions with other people, with the environment outside of us as an individual, is going to influence our feelings, our memories, our moods, those types of things. There are several basic affective states, moods and emotions, sentiments, and personality traits. A mood is a situation-specific, somewhat transient psychological response to an environmental stimulus. What does that mean? It means it's how we feel. And how we feel is a reaction to something from outside of us. Now, that, that external reaction is going to be based upon the social environment. There are a lot of different factors that are going to influence not just our moods, but also our performance. And what we do know is that the connection and the relationship between someone's mood, there's a direct correlation to their athletic performance. So for those of you that are very into sports psychology or coaching and things like that, then being able to understand whether someone is up or is down or is getting too excited or is too jittery, their basic mood can impact what it is that they're going to do on that particular day. We know that the, the past performance, so how people are able to cope with their mood and athletic performance, how they've done that in the past is going to influence how they do that in the future. The idea of profile of mood states. These are the major moods, especially in the world of sports psychology. Tension, depression, anger, vigor, fatigue, and confusion. It is worth noting that out of all these different moods, there is only one positive one, vigor. So that means a lot of time and a lot of effort needs to be spent on understanding moods, especially negative ones, and how to diminish their impact on not only human performance, but also upon the individual. The way that you are able to track how moods and athletic performance work together is with Morgan's mental health model. You've probably heard of it before. It's called the iceberg profile. And it's trying to identify graphically how a mentally healthy athlete scores in regards to all of those different moods. Negative moods should be below the mean of whatever population that you're looking for. And the only positive mood, that of vigor, should be well above the mean of the population. Here's an example. Tension, depression, anger, fatigue, confusion. All of these moods should be relatively small. If you're looking at a uh, hundred athletes, you want to make sure that the the athlete that's going to be performing the highest, the best, the most efficiently in regards to their particular sport at that particular time or that particular day is the person whose moods are in control. They're in control of their moods. Tension, depression, anger, fatigue, confusion, those things are kept to a minimum. But you want vigor or the excitement, the person that's ready and confident. You want that to be relatively high in regards to other athletes at that particular moment. We know that skill, physical skill, is important in terms of being athletically successful. But we also know 
that the mental capacity, the quote-unquote mental game of athletics is equally impactful in regards to athletic performance. Emotions and feelings, which are similar, uh, but they are, they are different than moods. Um, they're also not synonyms themselves. They're interrelated. They originate in separate areas of the brain, actually. Emotions are more body-oriented, while feelings are more mind-oriented. So, emotions you can almost feel, whereas feelings are going to be ideas. And those ideas sometimes can have, if you've ever heard of the phrase uh, psychosomatic response, then what we know is that emotions and feelings can be so powerful that they actually influence the body. And we measure those, those, those changes in, in the body through biofeedback, whether someone is going to sweat a lot. If you think about um, you're going to give a presentation and you're nervous, right? You, you get up in front of the class and you're going to talk about, you know everything that you need to talk about in that presentation, but how you deal with those nerves, how you deal with those feelings and those emotions, that's going to go a long way in determining whether you're successful during that particular presentation. The emotions tend to be instinctual almost, and you can measure those in the body. The feeling is more of what's going on. The feelings are the interpretations of these changes in, in body chemistry or changes in blood flow and changes in perspiration, those types of things. So these two ideas are always going to be interrelated, but it, it, it's, it's important to know that these are different. There are four basic feelings that we experience as human. You're mad, you're glad, you're sad, or you're scared. Now, you can have a lot of other feelings that are combinations of these, uh, such as you feel guilty that you missed the game-winning shot. Well, guilt is going to be a combination of you're mad that you missed the game-winning shot, you're sad for everyone that you missed the game-winning shot, and maybe you're even scared that you let your teammates down, or maybe you you let your family down, or you let your the fan base down. But Understanding the, the four basic feelings go is, is essentially the first way, the first step in terms of managing feelings, emotions, and moods in a proper, healthy way for the athlete. How do we take the psychological into work? Well, we know that understanding moods, emotions, feelings, personality types is important because it it's going to help increase our knowledge with regards to athletic performance or being successful in the world of business. Building a basic profile of athletes or employees is also helpful for developing and implementing and maybe even tracking goal achievements throughout an organization. Oftentimes this is going to come in handy when you're doing quarterly evaluations or yearly evaluations within an organizational setting. A psychological profile that includes information about the athlete's personality, maybe pre-competitive mood, may be an effective predictor of athletic performance. It's also going to be very important in terms of managing the employee base within a particular sport organizational setting. If you're more of a personal trainer, think about the psychological profile that you might have of particular clients. Oftentimes there are going to be areas where they overlap, but each client is going to be, most likely, different and need different things. Why do they need different things? Because perhaps their moods, their personalities, and their social lives are very, very different. We talk about developing a psychological profile or profiling, and I don't want you to think that this is something negative. It uh, also shouldn't be something that um, is done to marginalize employees or athletes. What you're trying to do is build a sketch of an individual. You're trying to understand them more. And why are you trying to understand them more? It's so you can help them be more successful in achieving their, their individual and then you all's collective goals moving forward. Profiling begins with asking some basic questions. Now, the questions that you ask are going are to change and vary based upon the goals of the individual, the age, um, the skill level of the individuals, um, what you as a team or as an organization need to accomplish. You have to, as a leader, develop the goals 
and then you're going to work with the individual athlete, for example, to develop their personal goals, who they are, where are they, where do they want to be. Another thing that we can also do, and, I, and I'm a big fan of this, is that as you're, as you're helping that individual grow and be successful, uh, I like to, again, look to other ideas. Um, and so in the world of sport, Margulies talks about learning from Einstein, the three things that Einstein can teach us and how they relate and apply to sports psychology. We just want to go through those very quickly. Einstein said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created, created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Hmm. It's forgotten the gift. So what we want to talk about is nurturing that individual. Thing number one from Einstein, nurture a curious mind. If, you, if you're not curious, then you're never going to want to find new strategies, new ways to be successful. I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious, said Einstein. Do not hold back with the curiosity. It has a reason for its existence. It pushes us. It moves us forward. It keeps us wanting to ask questions that better ourselves as individuals and as an organization. Thing number two. Perseverance is immeasurable. And this is associated with us in the world of sports psychology with mental toughness. You're always going to face barriers. You're always going to have hurdles metaphorically or literally, they're placed in front of you. Uh, I, I think what's interesting, a great example of this, is the idea of baseball. Um, and many other sports can serve as an example. But in baseball, you know, think about if you are a lifetime batter and you bat 333. Okay? It's pretty good. In fact, that's really good. And it means that you failed two-thirds of the time. You were only successful one-third of the time. That's the epitome of perseverance. Now, you can, you can mince words and sort of split hairs and say, what is success? Is hitting the ball success or is getting on base safely success? Both are valid. But nonetheless, it does serve as a great reminder that perseverance is going to be something that's very, very important within the world of sports. Pay attention to one thing at a time. And this deals with focusing, centering of attention, concentration, which we know to be the key to athletic success. Any man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. So what Einstein's saying here is that you need to focus. We, especially in this modern day age, we talk about multitasking all the time. And what we do know is that the research says we can multitask but we are not as successful at multitasking as we believe we are. And so those people that are able to focus their attention and concentrate on one mechanistic aspect of, of performing some sort of athletic feat, you get that down, you then move on to the next. That type of concentration is one of those attributes that's going to be not just important for athletic success, but also business success. Keeping this idea of the psychological profile, we want to talk about building something for your employees that can give you some information about how to help them. And so when you're tracking the employee's performance or the athlete's performance with different tasks over weeks, days, weeks, months, and maybe even years, you're able to start to predict what might happen in the future. It does not mean that you're going to be 100% successful in predicting what someone's going to do. But what we do know in sports psychology, as I've said before, is that the best predictor for future performance is past performance. And so, whether that's good or bad, what the leader can do, whether it's in an organization, a sport organizational setting, or if it's more in the athletic realm, is that the leader can take that idea, take the information that they have on the athlete or the employee and put them in positions to be successful. You identify and you uplift their strengths and you identify and help to address their weaknesses. 